questions happen within seconds. So I separated these out into two different categories. There's the physical category and the social category. So number one, let's go into physical. On one end of the spectrum, there is the person who has a torn jeans and torn shirt and it's all dirty and it just looks like it's been worn for days. It smells maybe really badly. That is on one spectrum all the way to the other spectrum. Maybe they're wearing white pants or white shirts and just pristine quality material, especially if it's a structured material. I want to emphasize that I'm not talking about luxury brands. It's not about that. It's more so the quality, the cleanliness, and does it actually fit your body? It's the reason why, of course, that when a man gets a bespoke suit, it's made for their body and it looks so good. Why is that? Because it's literally tailored to their body. For women, same thing. I've seen women who have always bought things in order to get it tailored. It is about fit, it is about material, and it is about, of course, cleanliness, keep it clean, and structure. The more structure and high material it is, that's going to look a lot better on the body. Secondarily, is so underestimated is the body language. Overall, it is a good idea to keep your posture. So don't come in all slouch. Make sure you keep your posture, shoulders down, and you walk with a purpose. So you have a purpose into walking in a room, so you're not just walking, staring up in the sky, <laughs> whatever, but you have a walk. When you think about James Bond or when you think about Marilyn Monroe, they really walk with purpose. Whatever that purpose may be, it might just be I want to sit down in that chair or I'm going to walk to my car. It doesn't matter what the actual purpose is, but there is a walk of purpose, like they're targeting something, like they're a lion about to attack their prey. And when you walk like that, naturally people just are drawn to you as a leader, as a person who might know where they're going, not just where they're actually going, but where they're going in life. It just goes into our psychology, our subconscious to think maybe that's somebody I should follow. I did a whole video on how to walk like a royal, so I'll link that below and a breakdown that I did. See how guests walked on stage. I mean, you can really tell who they think they are just by somebody walking into a room. Last but not least in the physical category is grooming. You want to make sure your teeth is clean, you brush your teeth, you have good breath, <laughs> and you want to make sure that if you went out sweating sweating to the gym, you sweat it out, you want to take a shower so you don't smell like a ball of sweat walking around. Hair grooming, when your hair is frizzy, out of control, people take you less seriously. And it's something I see all the time in professional settings is that you think, oh, just I'm going to come as I am, but maybe coming as you are isn't going to allow people to really be able to listen to what you're saying. And so we do have to realize what room that we're in. The way we groom ourselves and the way we dress ourselves, the way we are as a being needs to adjust in order to influence a specific room. So just something to keep in mind. Of course, you are lovable just as you are. However, if we're talking about influencing a person or a group of people to listen to you, we really want to pay attention to these particular things. Moving right on to the social aspect, woo woo, which I love. Okay, so <laughs> one of them is vocal tonality. This is something I talk about all the time and I love. So I'll link some videos down below if you think the tonality of your voice can use some work. Likely the answer is yes. I talk about uptone tonalities, neutral tone, and downtone. And mistakenly, people always think, oh, I should always use downtone tonalities because they are a statement. Statement. But sometimes, if you keep using downtone tonalities, uh, it doesn't work because you also have to keep in mind that you need to build rapport with the audience member if you're speaking on stage, let's say, or with a person one on one. So you want to do rapport building tonality, which is an uptone combined with a downtone tonality. So it's just a matter of playing it around and also knowing when to say what and why. 
Speaking of knowing when to say what, charisma is another aspect. Now, charisma is something that people, I think, mistakenly think that it's just a personality, natural trait that you can't gain. It's not a skill. Ooh, I think it is a skill. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason why there are classes on charisma and presentation skills, especially when it comes to people who are in the political arena. So you may not be in the political arena. However, it doesn't mean you can't utilize those skills. FBI agents who are trying to convince a criminal to confess. Do you think that happens without charisma and just an authoritative tonality? Mm, no. They have a level of charisma that goes into it to just get them loose, a little bit of fun. And then also they have the leadership component. There's different techniques to that. So I'll link all those videos below. But you can't just have charisma without a little bit of authoritative energy. And that is where leadership comes in. There's different ways on doing it, whether it's your tonality or whether it's the way you present yourself with your body language. I did a video on it giving Jessica Pearson from Suits as an example, and she's brilliant in that. Just by her body language alone, she shows her power, she shows her authority, and it's not overwhelming because she doesn't even need to say much. It's literally just her body language and her being centered and confident in it. Finally, the lost art of etiquette. Okay, so I am, if you don't already know, very obsessed with knowing the aristocratic world and how their social construct was and how their social skills and their etiquette was formed around it. And the reason why is because it's very extremely relevant to the social construct of today. You really have to look at the social construct of history in order to understand understand the social construct of today because in reality nothing much has changed and what I mean by that is when we look at the aristocratic world and we look at etiquette it was one of the ways that you would know that somebody was of higher not only social status but economical status because the aristocratic the higher you are the more etiquette that you showed it was their way of saying hey I'm a gentleman I'm a lady and the way I'm going to show it to you is having high etiquette. And the same is true for today. When people have low etiquette or they don't understand etiquette, that's typically because they're in a household in which perhaps the parents were so busy because they were working 24 seven that they didn't have time to teach their kids these things. And the same was true for back in the day with the peasants and the farmers as it is for today with people who are in lower income family households. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And so etiquette is something that it's a very um, subtle way of showing that, hey, look, I am of higher social status. It's also just a sign of respect because I can go into Japan. Let's say I am not Japanese because I am half Japanese and half German, but let's say I didn't know any etiquette of just regular social etiquette in Japan. I went onto a bus and there was an elderly person. Naturally, every young person, okay, remotely young person should stand up and offer their seats because they are an elder and elders must be respected. But if you don't know that, you're ignorant to that, you might stay sitting in your seat, right? Because you see two other young person offering their seat. So you just think to yourself, oh, that elder is clearly taken care of. But it doesn't matter in Japanese etiquette, you should still stand up and offer your seat anyway, because that is etiquette. And it also shows everybody else that, hey, this person is a foreigner. This person doesn't understand our culture and therefore we shouldn't respect that person as the same as us because they're clearly different. And that's something that happens all the time. You can tell when somebody is on your vibe, on your level, whatever that means, right? Maybe they use the same language that you use growing up, right? When you're a teenager and you listen to the same songs or you wearing the same type of clothes, we associate ourselves into subcategories based on these things. So maybe if I dress how I did dress when I was 13 years old, then I would attract the same people or the same mindset of 
my 13 year old me, which I would totally hate, but I graduated from that, so to speak, right? I don't dress the same as when I was 13 years old as I do now. And there's a reason for it because I'm not trying to attract that kind of person because I am no longer that person either. So it's a matter of knowing what kind of person you want to be and therefore what kind of person you want to attract around you in order to up-level yourself and up-level everybody else that is around you. Ultimately, I think that starts with you. Uplevel yourself and hopefully that's going to inspire others to uplevel themselves and then meet people who are doing the same, who are just like-minded people. That's my little rant to rant. So these were the seven signs of a high social status person. Hope you enjoyed it. Please hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Hit the like button. Comment below your favorite emoji based on this video and I will see you on the next video. Remember, raise your vibe.